If they asked me, I could write a book about the way you walk and whisper and look. Joining us now on our Book Talk segment, great to welcome to the show the New York Times best-selling author, Meg Waite Clayton. She's got a brand new novel out. It's getting a lot of great press. It's called The Race for Paris. It has to deal with a World War II and journalism and a lot of interesting things. We'll find out about it. She joined us by telephone today from out in Northern California. And Meg, good to talk with you. How are you? Great to talk with you, Doug. I am doing just fine. Yeah, congratulations, first of all, on uh, on the success of, of all your books. It's, it's always good to have New York Times best-selling author in front of your name. <laughs> it's always good. <laughs> that, is a, that is a real blessing. And, you know, there are so many really terrific books that don't necessarily reach the audience that they deserve. So I'm really just delighted uh, that readers have taken my book, books under their wing and, uh, and, and numbers. It's, very, uh, it's a real blessing. But when, when you first started writing or, and then decided to become a, a professional author, uh, I guess that's the goal of anybody, right? To be, a, uh, first of all, sell your book and then to become a best-selling author and then to get on the New York Times list. So the, the, those are the three goals I guess you have, right? I think there are a lot of goals. I mean, I think the most important thing is to write a really terrific book, mm -hmm. uh, and then you hope it finds an audience. Uh, I remember pretty early on in my career having a conversation with a, a, a very well-known author and her editor and her husband, and the question was, you know, would you take 10 uh, New York Times bestsellers or one National Book Award winner? And her answer was one National Book Award winner. Mm. Uh, and I, I sort of agree with that. I think that's the literature that survives for for a long time. I think bestsellers can come and go, but if you write something like, for example, To Kill a Mockingbird that stays around and affects generations, that's really special. So that, I would say, is my goal rather than becoming a bestseller. Yeah, I guess that's, that's the thing about novels as opposed to writing nonfiction. They're timeless in a sense, right? You get different generations hopefully reading it. That's exactly right, hopefully. That's the goal. Yeah. Well, let's talk about this book. Uh, and when we knew uh, we had a chance to talk to you, it, it sounded really like a great setting for a book. It takes place in Normandy, right, in June 29, 1944. And it's about two uh, war correspondents, women war correspondents. That, that was unusual for the time, wasn't it? That, that's exactly right. The book is inspired by the actual race for Paris and uh, a number of women journalists who were among the first to report the liberation of Paris in, in August of 1944. And I have uh, two fictional journalists. Uh, of course, the more uh, the more standard journalist is a, is a male there. There were a lot of men uh, who reported from the war uh, who had one set of rules that they played by, and uh, there were a handful of women who reported from the war, and they played by a whole other set of rules. And that's part of what I was exploring in the book, the difference that it made being a woman in that situation. And one is a, are they both photographers? One a photographer, one's a writer or a reporter. I have uh, I have two. I have three main characters. Liv Harper is what you would think of as she is my photojournalist. She's what you think of as a very ambitious kind of woman who would end up uh, covering uh, Normandy before women did, mm -hmm. willing to break the rules and bend the rules and do whatever it, that it takes to get the story. And then my other character, Jane Tyler, is a journalist, and she's a more traditional uh, more traditional woman for her time. She's basically a Nashville gal from the wrong side of the track who sort of backs into being a war journalist. By uh, She starts as a, as a secretary for the Nashville hometown paper when the war breaks out and men go off to war and they start needing uh, women to step up to be journalists and that's how she gets to be a journalist because the boys are gone. You see, it's based on, on real women that have done it or inspired by that. Did you get a chance to research them in depth uh, just to kind of get their background or and come up with a story from that? Absolutely. The book is very much inspired by some of the real journalists that I have come to learn about. In, in writing my first novel, which is also about a photojournalist, I came across a story in the very famous photojournalist Margaret Bork White's um, memoir, autobiography, uh, that really explored the intersection between being a war correspondent and motherhood. And it was, what I read was very moving and, and I, it made me want to explore that intersection. So then I started reading about a lot of the other women of correspondents, you know, Martha Gellhorn is certainly an inspiration for the story. She is somebody who so wanted to cover the liberation of 
uh, or still wanted to cover the Normandy invasion, and women were prohibited from covering that, that she stowed away in the loo of a hospital ship to get to France and went ashore with a stretcher crew, uh, becoming one of a very few correspondents to actually cover the, liber- the Normandy invasion from French soil. Her reward for her bravery, because she was a woman, was to be stripped of her military accreditation and uh, combined to a nurse's training uh, uh, training camp, and they meant to send her back to the United States. But being Martha Gellhorn, she hopped the fence, hitched a ride on a airplane to Italy, and covered the rest of the war without the benefit of a press credential, oh. sort of sweet chocolate sweet-talking wireless operators into uh, sending her work out and looking over the shol- her shoulders uh, for the military police who are charged with apprehending her. So she is very much the kind of, that's the kind of experience that I'm interested in exploring in the novel, and I certainly took that as a, as a bit of a leaping-off point. Well, without giving too much away, I never like to do that when I talk about novels, so you, you give kind of a capsule of uh, the storyline and uh, let people know what, what, what they can expect. Sure, absolutely. The story is basically uh, to Liv and Jane, my two journalists, uh, arrive in Normandy, get to know each other a bit at a, a nurse, at a field hospital uh, where they're both stationed, uh, and pretty quickly come to realize that they will not be allowed to cover more of the war uh, unless they start breaking the rules. So that's what they do. They break the rules. They uh, head off uh, against their commanding officers' uh, direct orders. They head off from their stations uh, toward the front, and they hook up with uh, Roebuck, who's a military photographer with a tendency to fall in love with the wrong people. Uh, he's, he's somebody who knows Liv from before the war, knows her husband very well, and so he takes them under his wing somewhat reluctantly. Um, he has a jeep, and they have no way to get around, so they are very happy to hitch a ride with him. And they, uh, they aim to be the first to report from Paris. Uh, and but in the meantime, they follow the troops in Normandy and, and report the war. I would think, uh, well before women were generally in uh, in that profession anyway, that uh, they would probably have uh, not, not had an easy time with a lot of the men, right? <laughs> a lot of the men talking about <laughs> uh, Do you write about that in the book? <laughs> uh, you know, actually, it's interesting. Uh, in all the research I did, you know, one of the things I found was the women, the women journalists um, faced a lot of, uh, barriers that the that the men did not. Um, they were they were they were not allowed even at the press camps. And the press camps were where the men went for twice daily briefings and you know, where they got all their supplies. You know, fresh film or uh, their typewriter ribbons, uh, you know, food and clothing and whiskey and all that kind of stuff. The women were not allowed at the, on the excuse that there were no women's latrines there and they weren't about to start digging them. <laughs> so. So, you know, the things that women didn't have were they didn't have transportation, they didn't have facilities for uh, work out like the men did. The men could wire their work, uh, the men could have their work censored on the spot. The women had to send their uh, work to Italy, to, I mean to uh, London to be censored, and uh, and they didn't have any ability to fix their articles after the censors were done with them. Uh, so they had those kind of challenges. But I have to say that in my research, it seemed that for the most part, the male journalists were uh, a congenial bunch and were were very good not only to each other, but also to the women who were uh, bold enough to join them. Mm-hmm. So that, yeah, that, and that is reflected in the book. There's, there are cameos by some of the great journalists of the time, um, you know, uh, Robert Kappa, who is a phenomenal, almost your listeners will know that anything they know about D-Day will come from his photographs, likely. Uh, and uh, Ernie Pyle, who is uh, just one of the greatest war journalists of all time. People like that make cameos, and they are uh, they are always presented in a good light. I think they were, were largely very good people. It was the military press that was the problem for my character. Yeah. Well, it's a great setting for a book. Of course, it takes place uh, during uh, Normandy, uh, World War II and about female journalists and it, again it's called The Race
Eyes for Paris. We're talking with Meg Wade Clayton today. Uh, Meg, uh, do you want to get out a website? People get a contact with you or get more information on the book? Absolutely. Your readers can find me at raceforparis.com, and it's Race for Paris. They want to gain the city, not get to the city, so not Race to Paris. Or my name, I'll run together, megwadeclayton.com. Great. And I see you on your schedule here. you got a busy touring schedule coming up, so uh, congratulations on that. And please keep in touch with us. I'd love to talk to you when your next book comes out. Thanks so much. A delightful talking with you, Doug, and thanks for hosting me. If you'd like to order the book we're talking about, please go to DougMilesMedia.com and enter the author's name in the Amazon search box. Thank you for listening. Please come back soon for more conversations here at DougMilesMedia.com. This has been a presentation of Doug Miles Media, all rights preserved. You can listen to or download previous programs at iTunes, Stitcher.com, or Doug Miles Media.